Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will sustain the one and despise the other. Words taken from the gospel for the 14th Sunday after Pentecost. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Why is it that man cannot serve two masters? Among other reasons, it is because man is made with a certain built-in determination, as every parent knows. That is, man readily sets himself on a course from which it is difficult for him to turn. Call how God gave Adam time and multiple chances to turn from his sin, something we spoke of a few Sundays ago, He resisted at least four times. Think of the sinful men of Sodom. Even after being blinded, it's an amazing story, even after being blinded by the angels protecting Lot and his family, they still groped for the door. St. Paul had to be unhorsed on the road to Damascus and blinded before he would change course. But once he changed, nothing could stop St. Paul from embracing the cross, crucifying himself and his concupiscences, as he mentioned today in the lesson. Once he changed, neither scourgings, shipwreck, betrayal, persecutions, nor thorns in the flesh could derail him. He remained faithful unto the end. And sadly, we know Many a drug or alcohol addict has to hit bottom before they'll change. Why is this? Well, from philosophy, we distinguish between an act of man and the human act. Now, the act of a man or act of man is an action performed by a human being, but not freely, as we use the word, or in a specially human way. In other words, it's something like digesting food. We don't control that, but it's happening. It's an act of a man, our heart beating. If I hit your knee and it jerks, that's an act of a man. Whereas the human act proceeds from deliberate reason and free choice of the will. Deliberate reason and free choice of the will compose a human act. It is said to be imperfect when performed with some element of obscurity, haste, some preceding passion, or any factor that weakens freedom. Thus, we have things like, you know, second, third, fourth, whatever it is, degree murder. You know, this person was under an influence, was not as perfect, cold-blooded, first degree. But it is said to be perfect when the act is performed with full deliberation and choice, first-degree murder. And so when a human act is perfectly willed, the man is settled in his choice. He is determined, making it hard for him to turn. This is one way we can see how man cannot serve two masters. Once he has set upon one, he cannot serve another. I also bring this up because it helps us understand why men who start out as reformers or friends of the church, how it is they end up betraying the church and becoming seemingly irreformable heretics. We see an image of this in the story of Job. His friends came to comfort him even remaining silent. They came from a distance. They put some work into it. They loved Job. They cared about him. They remained silent for days, prayerful and supportive of his trial. Then they set on a course that did not end well because they were convinced he had sinned. Soon they were vocalizing all sorts of mean imaginings about Job and beating him up verbally, trying to get him to confess. 
And what they said was mean and utterly false by the time they were done. And they greatly upset God. If it weren't for Job, they would have been in really big trouble. Who saved them? Do I not speak truly in saying that the church has lots of these troublesome types today? Men on all sides claiming to be friends and reformers who have fallen into some error. One way to see this is is to return to St. Pius X. As a faithful pope, he countered the widespread heresy of modernism at the turn of the 20th century. After spending much time explaining its errors in Pescendi, a fantastic papal document, he said this, With our eyes fixed upon the whole system of modernism, No one will be surprised that we should define it to be the synthesis of all heresies, the gathering together of all heresies. Undoubtedly, he says, were anyone to attempt the task of collecting together all the errors that have been broached against the faith and to concentrate into one the sap and substance of them all, he could not succeed in doing so better than the modernists have done. Thank you, Pope Pius. Modernism is a combination of all heresies. Let's then consider a few things from heresies of old that have found a home in modernism and are affecting us today, especially even in the trad world, as it's been called. And namely, I want to concentrate on three, Montanism, Protestantism, and Jansenism. This may sting a little, but it's important we understand the danger in which we are in. From the Handbook of Heresies by M. L. Cousins, or Cousins, Loretto Publishers puts it out, we read about Montanism. It says, claiming to act under the immediate inspiration of the Holy Ghost, Montanus and his followers first preached a revival of penance and primitive fervor. Gradually, however, they exalted themselves above the official hierarchy of the church. There it is. They exalted themselves above the official hierarchy of the church under the pretense of a new and personal revelation. You could read here the extraordinary mission that they claim they have. I've got a mission. Tertullian, the writer to whom the Latin church owes so much, fell a victim to the heresy And in his later work, De Pudicitia, which is meaning concerning modesty, between 217 and 222, he wrote this book. He attacks the Roman pontiff. Here is Callistus I. With extreme bitterness, because he refused to sanction the merciless rigorism which Montanism inculcated. In other words, he was mad that Callistus was allowing apostates to come back and reconcile with the church. That upset him. He wanted a pure, ideal church. But notice the point I'm trying to make here. They raised themselves above the hierarchy and sat in judgment over the Pope, Montanus and Montanism. How about Protestantism? In order to distance themselves from the Catholic Church, the Protestant revolutionaries advocated an invisible church. They held the visible Roman Catholic Church was corrupt and had been abandoned by God. For them, the seat was vacant, no longer that of St. Peter. Instead, they held a sort of ethereal church they belonged to, in which only God knew for certain who were the members in contrast to the visible church scattered throughout the world, of which John Calvin declared, in this church that is the Holy Roman Catholic Church, there is a very large mixture of hypocrites who have nothing of Christ but the name and outward appearance. Don't get involved with those wicked people, and those sinners. We got this ideal, ethereal church. The church fathers, starting with St. Augustine, held the invisible church and the visible church to be one and the same thing. Notice these men, these heretics, John Calvin and company, 
placed themselves not only over the hierarchy, as did Montanus, but over the church itself, deciding what it was or what it was not. Hmm. Finally, Jansenism. Again, from the Handbook of Heresies, in spite of all efforts of bishop or pope, the Jansenist heretics refused either to submit to or openly leave the church. Hmm. By continual publication and insidious arguments, they managed to taint even those whom they could not formerly corrupt. So notice these men remained in the church even as they denied her rights over them. Listen to part of a letter from Father Ollier, the founder of the Sulpicians, who helped renew the priesthood in France, to someone in danger of being won over by the Jansenists. He says, Beware! Error has always insinuated itself into the church under the guise of reform. The last heretics, Jansenists, when asked who sent them, they replied, No one. We come of ourselves. When again they were asked, where then were the signs of their extraordinary mission and the approbation of the Holy See? They made no answer, for they had none to make. Nevertheless, they continued spreading abroad their doctrine without mission, without approbation of their superiors, a condition absolutely indispensable and one which has always been so regarded in the church. St. Paul himself, an apostle, as he was, took his directions from St. Peter. No, he says, without submission there is no security. Besides, I see in those who have gained you over to their party so much obstinacy, impetuosity, contempt to all who do not think as they do, so much esteem of themselves to the prejudice of the church and of the whole body of the faithful. Father Ollier, thank you. Again, notice these heretics claimed to remain Catholic and yet ignore all the directives from the hierarchy. They weren't seeking the kingdom of God. They were seeking themselves, a rather crafty way of doing it. Now, Pope Pius indicated these errors are all wrapped up in modernism. It seems to me one easy way to understand modernism is this. It seeks to remove the vertical from everything. It wants to flatten everything out. Thus, modernists deny miracles. They deny the supernatural. It's very tiresome hearing them, isn't it? How they deny a miracle, how they explain it away. That's modernism. But can we not see the errors just mentioned? Modernism present? They remove the vertical of the hierarchy. Another way to understand them is simply this. They take words and then they say they believe in them. Then they take and they gut it of its meaning and put something else in there. And say, see, we believe. You can't call us heretics. Thus, for example, the doctrine of hell is not denied. They say there's a hell. Then they just vacate it of all its meaning and say there's nobody there. How convenient, dare we hope, they say, hell is empty. Well, it seems to me, given this exposition, we're in a good position to see what is happening to the church, especially in our part of the church, the traditional trad movement, if we want to call it that, in our time. Under the cloud of all this encompassing heresy in which we're passing, it's very difficult, I agree. And so we ask... What about all those bloggers and YouTubers who stand in judgment, exalting themselves over the Pope, bishops and priests, even calling them names? Are they not like the Montanists of old, rising above and standing in judgment over the hierarchy? Clear to me, there's a whiff of modernist behavior here. They're not seeking the kingdom of God, but rather a clever way of seeking themselves. They claim to be friends of the faith, friends of the truth, and reformers of the church, but they end by falling into the very thing they hate, modernism. 
They level hierarchy or they disassemble it or remove verticality or seek to replace it with their own. And what about those groups who claim there's a difference between eternal Rome and modernist Rome? How different is this from the false doctrine of the invisible church of the Protestants? God never promised those on the seat of any place would ex- always be pure and clean of, of error, that they would always be professing doctrine perfectly. There can be heretics, sad to say, occult heretics, material heretics, holding positions. Once they're declared a formal heretic, they can be removed. None of them have. This is the problem. I have had a number of times some people have asked me, how can you be united to that modernist bishop? How can you stand it? I've been told that a number of times they're asked that. Well, if we are really truly to be Catholic, it's in the definition, right, that we are united to a bishop that is united to the Holy See, the Pope. And they take the name of Rome and they just gut it of its meaning. And then they say, no, Rome is this ethereal thing. Wait a minute. Rome has always been a place on the earth in which the Holy See resides, in which we honor as the home of the Holy See. The Vatican Hill, upon these bones of Peter, I will build my church. The bones are there. Nothing's changed. Again, do we not smell the workings of modernism in this and similar statements? Indeed we do. Keep in mind, the Protestants were all sedificantists too. Denying the reigning pope was valid or had any authority over them. Modernism is returned in the sedificantist movement and those who claim they are united to some imaginary, ethereal Rome, ethereal church, which is really, it's all fake. There is one church, and the visible and invisible are the same church. That's it. Finally, in a similar vein, what about those so-called trads who claim to profess the true faith regardless of what sect they belong to? And there's quite a variety. A lot of them around here, too. Even, some even go from chapel to chapel. They all think they are faithful members of the church, even though they are outside the reach of any prelate. Again, we get here a strong whiff of what the Jansenists in France were doing, saying they were Catholic but not subjecting themselves to anyone. Ah, don't do what we want. No one's going to tell me what to do. If I want to build a chapel here, I'll build a chapel here if I want. That is so not traditional. Entire history of the church, if you want to build a chapel, you have to have permission from the local bishop to do that. Period. That's a strong whiff of what the Jansenists were doing in France. Now, this too is modernist. It becomes rather obvious when the Pope promulgates a difficult and unwanted and unsavory modo proprio, such as Traditionis Custodes leading these groups to say, well, that doesn't pertain to us. Thank you, Holy Father, but that's nothing to do with us. Well, then, to whom does it pertain? Is this not like King Henry VIII, once upon a time, defender of the faith, saying that whatever Rome decided did not apply to his realms? Whatever you say, Rome, doesn't apply to my country and my realms. Oh, that's nice. Okay, let's go about our business. That sounds an awful lot like King Henry. These groups say also set up their own marriage tribunals to annul marriages, just like King Henry. All this is modernism too. Remember, it is the synthesis, the gathering together of all heresy, not just those we don't like. The human act, once deliberated and willed, is a difficult thing to change. Only a powerful grace will do the job. Thus we have the last gospel. Not by the will of man, but the will of God can man believe, bend his knee. Only a powerful grace will do the job. Moses resisted God some five times after having turned even. Remember, he's in the desert. He turned and went up the mountain, knelt humbly before the burning bush. 
But he only agreed to go back to Egypt to rescue God's people after God grew angry with him because he resisted him five times. On Easter Sunday, his majesty, risen from the dead, had to walk some miles away from the holy city of Jerusalem with the two disciples, explaining all the Old Testament to them, types and prophecies, it says. They only converted after the miracle the mass was offered to them. They ran back to the Jerusalem to rejoin the apostolic church. And so it is with us and all men. Once we're committed, we don't like giving up. This common fault of man is an excess of the virtue of perseverance, namely the sin or vice of pertinacity or stubbornness, obstinacy, in continuing to pursue an activity or desire which is not reasonable, that is unwise, harmful, or unlawful. The moral theologians explain this is one of the main causes of formal heresy. All modernists, as you probably know well, are stubborn people. In light of today's gospel about not serving two masters, Cornelius Alapid from the commentary on Genesis indicates how this flows from original sin. No surprise. In describing the motives of Adam and Eve in eating the forbidden fruit, they strove, he said, after the divine omniscience, the divine omniscience, to no good and evil. No doubt, he says, so that by themselves and by the power of their own nature and abilities, they could direct themselves in all things by discerning and choosing what is good and by avoiding what is evil. Therefore, they would be able to direct themselves to live well by their own knowledge, by their very own prowess, by their own strength, and gain complete happiness. Thank you, Cornelius Alapid. They'll guide themselves. We don't need anybody else. They lack that holy hatred of self that is the beginning of humility and the fear of the Lord. They lacked much wisdom. Folks, dearly beloved, we're being tested today with the lack of guidance and holy and faithful, faith-filled priests and prelates. I agree, it's hard. But God and his hierarchical church must remain our master. We are not our own masters. We want to seek the kingdom of God first. He's found in his church always, his visible church, his hierarchical church. There's no exception. Oh, how important it is for us to be truly humble then, not resisting the grace of God flowing through his church and its hierarchy. Knowing our place and taking our place in that church, willing to be led, ever trusting in divine providence to deliver her and us from this trying time, persevering faithfully within her confines, even, I know, even if we, like Job, have to remain naked and on a stinking dunghill. What is more, This situation behooves us to give good examples of what this humility looks like, what holy hatred of self looks like, praying all the while that the grace given to Moses, to St. Paul and the disciples on the road to Emmaus be granted to those under the spell of these insidious elements of modernism present all around us. No man can serve two masters, For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will sustain the one and despise the other. May the church, may God's church always be our master. May we all be saved souls together in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.